Yes. 85. That was the longest answer. 27 is car crash cost. Now, this is good. So, an 85 is where we first learn about uh, hypothesis tests using T scores, where we don't know the real population standard deviation. So, they're allowed now to give us just a list of data, and we have to find our own X bar and standard deviation. What's the quickest way to find those since we're not in chapter 3 anymore? Yeah, put it in category. Uh, list one, do one bar stats. That's the quickest way to find X bar and S. I made you go through that in chapter three. In fact, some of you guys just got back chapter three homework where I'm reminding you that I'm making you do those things because you didn't do them in the first place. But since you've already gone through that, I'm not going to make you do it again. So on number 27, they give you this list of data. And they ask you to test the claim test the claim that when tested under the same conditions the damage cost for the population of cars is a mean of 5,000. Cool. So we've taken a sample. We've got a claim about the population that we're going to use our sample to kind of test. Our sample's crazy small and probably true to form. Triola sometimes forgets to say anything about the normality of things. So here I don't know if they said anything about... It doesn't look like they did. Yeah, here we go. At the very beginning it says in the following exercises assume it's from a normal distribution. Because here we only have n equal to 5. It's nowhere near big enough. But they're saying the original population was normal already. So n does not have to be at least 30. It could be anything. And we're good. Um, so let's take a minute and do these numbers. Let me put it up here for the book list amongst us. Alright, don't say anything out loud yet. Take a minute and figure out what the mean and the standard deviation for that set of data is. If you need a gap, I got two up here. So I just want you to figure out what X bar and S. Only five things up there. So what do you get for X bar? 6,412. And S? What do you get here for S? Yeah, so 19... 26.803. Cool. Okay. Not too bad. Now, the claim is that the mean is 5,000. We got a mean of 6,412. It's like, holy crap, how's that ever? But our freaking sample so tiny. Our standard deviation is pretty damn big. So there's still a chance that that's not far enough away from 5,000 since our sample is so tiny. You guys with me? And you can have actually, you can have like this huge sample. If this was our claim, was it's 5,000, and we have this huge sample, and we get 5,020, that might actually be enough evidence that it is not that. Because our sample is so big that we trust the 5,020 more than we trust the 5,000. Here, our sample is tiny. I don't know. 
guys, you got to do this stuff. So, so what's step one here? What's the what's the claim in math? I want to hear about the great <laughs> When they redo this room, they're supposed to put solid doors up. That'd be nice. So how do we, what's the claim here? Mu equals 5,000. Yeah, mu is 5,000. Which one is that? The whole. The whole, all right. And then what's the high then? Yeah, look, it's got to be not equal to 5,000. So how many tail tests is it going to be? Two. Two. Cool. Uh, number two should be pretty obvious considering what section we're in. But don't get too complacent about that. Obviously, I'm not going to say, this is from section blah, blah, blah. You know, you've got to know what you're... So what is it that tells me if I can use a Z or a T or nothing? What's one thing I know already? It's normal. No, it's normal. So it tells me it's normal. And what about the standard deviation? Good. We don't know sigma. We only know S. Therefore, I must use T squared. So then step three, they say use alpha point oh five. So it's a two tail test, alpha point oh five. What else do you need to know before you can look up the T scores? Degrees of freedom. So the N here is of course five degrees of freedom. Four, I love it. One less. When you look up the T score, so alpha is 0.05, it's a two tail test. Beautiful, I love it. 2.776. So, how do you say this in words? Good, all right, if T star is one of two things. Yeah, greater than 2.776 or less than negative 2.776, we can do what? Reject the null, beautiful. That's why we call it the rejection region, because if you get in there, you can reject the null, which also another way of saying that is I can... Support the high. Cool. I like it. Cool. So now I've set up what far enough away is. I go and see how far away I got. So what do we know from the sample? We figured out that, well, we know n is 5. We got x bar and s there. This is the part that people get tripped up about. What do I have to do before I actually calculate the, in this case, the T-score, but it's the same formula as the Z-score. What do I still have to do? Mm. New standard deviation. I've got to change this. This is the one for individuals. I need the one for groups of five. So I still have to take this one, divided by a square root of five in this case. Eight six one point six nine. Six nine. Are there three places? Six nine two. Cool. And now I can calculate the T score. And what I really, really want you to understand: the formula doesn't care. That's why sometimes I use Z star T star. It doesn't matter. It's the same formula. I just either use S or sigma. 
it really shouldn't even be given a name like that. It should just be finding your results from your sample. Who cares if it's Z or T? It's just a number that tells you how far away it is. And I know how far away I need to get. So to see how far away my sample is, my X bar is 6412 minus 0.2 minus the 5,000 from the clay for the hypothesis. How far apart are those two relative to this, the new standard deviation? So it's always the same formula. My stuff minus the middle divided by whatever standard deviation is appropriate. And that's going to be your, if you want to call it T star. Okay. Yeah, cool. So we get 1.64. So here's 0, 1.64 is about there. So what can we say right there? What did we, did we manage to find evidence? Did we, can we reject something? Did we fail? We failed. We failed. We failed to reject the hope, which also means we failed to support the high. Try to figure out how to do number five. So now, this is the part that people really dislike. And all you have to do at this part, at, the, at this point, once the first time I, I worried about the claim was right at the beginning. Since then, I haven't cared about the claim. Now I think, well, which one's my claim? Is it HO or H1? Which one's my claim? Yeah. HO, because my claim was equal, my HO is equal. So I use this language. That's how I know how to put together that last statement. You guys kind of with me? So I've got, you got to be careful. You can't say, I reject this. You can't say you support this. You either reject or fail to reject this guy. You support or fail to support this guy. All right, so now I know exactly how to word my conclusion. I'm going to use that language there. Fail to reject that. So we have not found sufficient evidence to do what? Reject the claim. And then you just put the language from the claim. That the population mean is $5,000. You could be even more specific. I don't know. I can't remember what this money was about. Off the top of my head, you could be more specific about the population mean $5,000 for what. But if you put this at least, I'll be very happy. If you just put, we have not found sufficient evidence to reject the HO. Not be losing points, not good enough, bring in some language to tell me what you're really talking about. Cool. And all I gotta do is rewrite what the claim is. And they have to tell you that directly. So that was 85 number 27. Yeah. Anything else from homework or from the quiz? Yeah. Um, 10.2 number 6. Oh yeah, so that table I showed you a while back, they talk about it in, in the chapter, in the section. It's on page 
Here we go, page 608. So number six is about heights of mothers and daughters. So obviously you would think that possibly there would be a relationship between how tall your mom is and how tall the daughter, if you're the daughter, how tall you are, right? So you'd think there might be some kind of relationship, but it might be the father you got your height from, who knows? But there should be some kind of a relationship. And they actually found 0.693, which on first glance looks decent, right? But they had a very small sample. They had eight mother-daughter pairs. So is that enough? If you look on page 608, how much of an R do you need for eight? And when in doubt, you use 0.05, but here it doesn't really matter. They got 0.693. What's the easier one to pass? What's, what's the lower value that you need in the table? So page 608. Sample size here is 8. How much of an R do you need to pass? If you use alpha equal to 0.05. Here it doesn't matter. Either one you use, you're getting the same result. So if your R is 0.693, is that enough? What do you need? What's the minimum R required for sample size of eight? I love it, 707. Cool, you got 0.693. Does that show correlation? Is that evidence of correlation? No, you didn't make it far enough away, right? It says you have to have at least 0.707. We got 0.693, not enough evidence, right? If our sample was much bigger, 0.693 would be beautiful. It'd be perfect. But our sample's so freaking small that it's got to do even more work. And we see that like this problem we just did here, that was much bigger than it would have been if it would only if it would have been a larger sample. This would have been much smaller. It would have been easier to pass that test. It's always going to be harder to show evidence when our sample is smaller. And that's from day one we knew that a bigger sample was the way to go. The bigger your sample is, the more sure you are about what you're saying. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. Is that cool? Yeah. So that one, it's kind of weird when you first read it. You're not sure what they want from you, but you can't just speak that one out. You actually got to go to the table and say, well, here it says it's got to be this. Anything else from Yeah. Could you do 1B on the practice test? 1B? Yeah. So 1B, in order for that to work, you have to have a little bit of 1A done. So let's see. Yeah. I was about to say, now i got a few more people. Anybody else need the practice test? Let's see, 1A. Let's look at 1A first. So we have a sample of 32. Uh, the mean time is 7.1 hours a week. Standard deviation is 2.25. So really, two things going in. If I don't really ask it, it's kind of obvious. But here, why do I know I can do this in the first place? Why do I know I can do anything with this? Sample's bigger than 30. So I know it's normal enough to do stuff with. Um, so I want a 98% confidence interval. Now the next question I have, so it's normal, because n is bigger than 30. How do I know which formula to use? The x bar plus or minus z, blah, blah, or the x bar plus or minus t. Do I use a z score or a t score? T, t why? Because this came from the sample. And you see how I don't say a sample standard deviation of, I don't say that, but you can just follow it back. Where did I get that 2.25 from? From that sample of students that was taken. 
So it must be S. And I purposely used SD, so I, I didn't say which one it was. But this is S sigma unknown. I must use T scores. Cool. So now I can just put together this, this formula. And what I really need from part A for part B to work, because Elizabeth's question is about part B, I need the T-score we're going to use here. So what T-score will you? What's the degrees of freedom? 31. Effectively, is it's a one or a two tail. What's every confidence interval is always two tail. Right? And my alpha is going to be what? One or two, I love it. So point oh two alpha, two tail, degrees of freedom is thirty one. What T score do we get? Yeah, two point four five three. I love it. Let me stop right there. Can everybody find that? It seems to be crucial. If you can't find that, you can't do a lot of things. That is a statistics basic skill. Right. Okay, cool. You either can all find it or you want to hold your piece. That's fine. So then I can use this formula here and plug and shot. We figured out X bar and S, and then they were given to us. The mean and the standard deviation, I could throw that in there. We figured out the T score that we need. So part A is pretty straightforward, getting that confidence interval. Is that cool? So here I'm going to put the mean, uh, the T-score, uh, the standard deviation over the square root of 32. And the people that do really well in statistics are the people that remember why this formula is the way it is. If I started the mean and I go up and down this many steps, I'm going to catch this much percent of the data. I mean, that's why this goes together. That's why that equation makes sense to answer this question. So what, you could certainly do a lot of the work without having a clue what I just said. You could do a lot of the work. There's a lot of plug and shove stuff. You could figure out which equation you use, so forth. But to interpret what you find, it's better to understand why it works in the first place. All right, so this is all on the answer key. That's not a big deal. But what I need for part B, because part B says, how many more students would you need to be within half an hour? Because here I got within how much? What do you get for the error here? Somebody done that? I've got it. I'm looking. Yeah, like 9, 8. So we got basically within an hour. Is that cool? 0.98 hours. I'm going to call that an hour because I'm a human being. Right? So let's see, that's about an hour. So if I took 32 students and I get within an hour, how many students do you think I'll need to get within half an hour? You're going to be wrong, but that's okay. All right, there you are. Yeah, you think 64, but of course there's some squares involved here, right? So it's, never, it's not quite just doubling it. If I need half as much error, I need four times as many Students, roughly. Okay, let's see if it works out. So here, I want to be within half an hour. I use, I'm still in the same situation. I still use this T-score, 2.4. I can't use a Z-score here, so I just use a T-score instead. It's not a big deal. The formula really is this here. All right, well, if I don't have Z, I use T. If I don't have sigma, I use S. Not a big deal. So we know T is 2.453. We know S is 2.25. What's one half? What does that go in for? Error. Error, because I want to be off by a half an hour. So error is 0.5. And now it's just plug and chuck. So S and sigma are basically the same thing. They're both standard deviations. One's for sample, one's for population. T and Z are both basically the same thing. They give an idea of distance. One's for when I know sigma, one's for when I don't know sigma. I mean, that's why the formula doesn't change, really. You have to write down a whole new formula. So n would be 2.453 squared, 
squared divided by point, yeah, one half an hour squared. And you do end up with very roughly four times this, just about, right? What do you guys get when you do that? Yeah, you get 121.8, I think. So you round it up to 122. Now, if you just said 122, I'm okay with that, but officially the question says how many more people? How many people did I already talk to in part A? 32. I need 122 total, so I need 90 more. Right? But if you just stop at 122, I'm not making it a trick question. That's fine. But officially you need 90 more. How did, I knew, how did I know to use that formula, that N equals business? How did I know to use that? Because you teach this stuff, Jeff. Huh? Yeah, I'm looking for, it says how many more, how many, how many? That's N. So I know I need a formula that's got N equals something. Okay. Yes, how did you know you needed four times? How did you know that you needed four times? Because these are squared. So if I, if I want this to be half as much, you square two. If I want to be a third as much, I'd have to have nine times as many people, three squared. Okay. Yeah. Just because that's squared. Cool. It's not a linear relationship. Anything else from homework or, yeah? Um, technically three numbers. Oh, so they bring back mothers and daughters. All right, so we just got done talking about the mothers and daughters thing, and we said that the 0.693 was not good enough. All right, so then they tell me in this problem, this is the next section where 10.2 is all about R, 10.3 is all about the line, if I spit. So here's a funky question. It, if... Um, If I have no idea, well, let me put it up here. Um, they got a line of best fit of this. Okay. Funky dog. So the mean height of the mothers is 63.1. Mean mom. <laughs> right after yeah, I know. Mean dot. Sixty-three point three. So if you put in the mom's height here, this would calculate the daughter's height. Right, so it's a relationship between the two. Um. Da, ba, ba. Find the best predicted height of a daughter, given that the mom has a height of 60. Now, real quick, remember, this is the one that had the 0.693, and remember R had to be greater than 0.707? That's the one we just did a minute ago. And I, this is why I told you to do 10.2 and 10.3 together, because a lot of the questions kind of refer to each other. So that tells me what about this problem? What, what did it tell me, the fact that this is not big enough? I can't say there's correlation, there's not evidence for it. Which means, what do I think about this line? Do I trust the line? No. no. So do I use this equation? No. Hell no. It exists. That's nice. I'm not going to use it. Right? Therefore, what's my best guess in any situation? What is my best guess for the height of a daughter? Just somebody give me a daughter. That sounded weird, but somebody give me a daughter. What's the, my best guess for what her height is? What do you think? What's always your best guess? The mean. So no matter what the mom's height is, my best guess for the daughter is 63.3. If there's a correlation, I have an equation that refines that guess, that makes it better based on the mom's height. But I didn't show correlation between the daughter and mom's height. Therefore, I'm not going to use this. I, I can't. It's not good enough. I can't trust what it's going to do. I have to just say this to everything. 
What about this daughter? 63.3. What about her? 63.3. I, I, sorry. Does that make sense? You can't use the mom's height to refine your prediction for the daughter's height because you didn't show evidence that this line is good. You didn't show evidence that this line is a good predictor because R wasn't strong enough. It's pretty damn close. So I would just go out and take a few more people on my sample, which would reduce the need here, and hopefully it wouldn't. It would stay about that level. You guys kind of with me? That's what I would do if I really wanted to use an equation. Just get a little bit more people on my sample. I only talked to eight people. Can't be that lazy. Does that make sense? Is that cool? Those two go together. I can't trust, I can't show correlation, therefore I can't trust the equation. So my best prediction would be the average. If I did get R good enough, I could have just put 60 there. And it would have told me a better prediction. Okay. So that goes together. The R being closer to 1 or negative 1. And what's close enough is determined by how big the sample is. If it is close enough to 1 or negative 1, this equation is usable. I can use it to predict things. If I can't use that to predict things, I have to fall back to my really crude, horrible thing where I just have to say the mean for everything. That's my best guess for anything is the mean. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Do you need more chapter 10 examples? I can't. Yeah. Um, Anything in particular? There's more on stuff that would be on the test. Yeah, here's what I'm going to need from you. On the uh, test, I'm going to have the correlation problem. You're going to have to come up and show me on your calculator. You're going to show me the scatter plot with the line on top. You with me? So you got to show that to me, and I initial on your test, and then you head back to your seat. So you want to make sure you can do that. So obviously in your homework, you don't have to show me your calculator for every homework problem. But you want to make sure you can actually do it and have it show up. Did anybody have a specific problem out of 10.2 or 10.3 that gave them trouble that you want to see done? Or somebody just realizes this is a great opportunity to have me do a homework problem for you. Just pick one randomly if you haven't done it yet. I mean, that's what I would do if I was sitting in class right now. And the teacher was saying, I'm going to do a homework problem for you. Pick one. It's not homework. Um, that's what I thought. All right. There's hope for you. Could you do a little practice test? I could, but I got it all worked out here, remember? Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'll save you from that. That one's done for us. Oh, okay. I'm not looking. I'm just looking at the sign homework. <laughs> Pick a higher number. Uh, 13? Okay. 13 will work. Is a smarter choice. You have chosen wisely. So this is what we had from last time. I think we actually did the one on the practice test last time. Um, so the first thing you're going to do is go in here and clear out list one and list two. Okay. So 
I'm going to put some new data in. So number 13, if you don't have your book, just stare blankly into space or copy them down as I do these. So this is the consumer price index versus the cost of a slice of pizza. small set of data. Ten two should have the same Yeah, ten two is number thirteen is the same, but in ten two they ask you to find the um, R value. And in ten three they ask you to find the equation of best fit. So I would just like I said do both together. Because you're gonna get both out of your calculator at once. Now what steps do I go through to get the line of best fit, to get the equation, and to get the R? What do I do? Stats. Stat, I love it. It's always a good guess. Calc. 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 Yeah, you got to love it, the one that's got the equation line in it. So number four. And then it defaults to L1, L2, so you just hit enter. Now again, on the day of the test, if you are borrowing a calculator and you're not sure if R is going to show up, you can either just bring it up to me right off the bat or you can wait till you get to this problem. If R doesn't show up, you can bring it up to me and I'll make R show up if you forgot how to ha make that happen. Does anybody currently have R not showing up who's playing along? So we had a silly small sample, right? Yes. Can you try to do that Sure. Right. So you got, and again, this is all in your calculator, but um, you put your data in, list one, list two. Where did you list three from? Uh, list three is just left over from some time earlier in our past. Um, so it's gone. Uh, so list one, list two is the data I'm working with right now. Doesn't really matter what's in the other lists. Go to stat. I want to calculate something with the data that I put in. And then number four is the one that's got the equation of a line in it. And then if you hit enter, it defaults to list one, list two. So if you put them in list three, list four, you've got to actually tell it list three, comma, list four. That's why it's sitting there waiting for you. Hit enter, and it should show you this here. Now on the test. Say again? What do you do if you're not getting R? You, you call me over? Alright. Is that your account? Yeah. Cool. So then you won't have to do this next. That's why I'm not going to show you Cool. So you're set for next time. Um, considering it's a small sample, it almost doesn't matter. I mean, that's damn close to one. Which means it's really close to being what? type of correlation. Perfect. Perfect positive. It's decently close. It is a really small sample though, so just to be safe, how big was this sample again? Four, five, six. If I look back on page 608, for sample of size six, for alpha 0.01, the harder one is 0.917, so we're well above that, so that's showing correlation. If my sample was only four big, this would not be good enough at the 0.01 level. You guys with me? If I only had four things in my sample, it's like you've got to show me crazy evidence. Thankfully, we got size six. That's good enough. 
which means what about my line? What, what does that mean about my line? Does it mean anything about my line, my poor little line? I like it. It means it's positive slope. Cool. But what about what's the R being good enough showing correlation? What does that mean? We how do we feel about the line of best fit? Do we trust it? Yeah. Yes. Good. All right. Good. Sweet. So if I asked you to make a prediction using it, I would do that. I wouldn't have to use the average or whatever like we did for the mom's height. I could actually use the equation to plug stuff in because I trust this line. How do I make the picture show up now? Zoom nine. Second. Zoom nine. Good. So you hit zoom nine. Anytime you put brand new data in, hit zoom nine. It tells the calculator to go find that data. There it is. Now, where's my line? I haven't put it in yet, right? Can't hold that against the calculator. It's like, come on, calculator, what the hell? So you put in your line 0.01x plus 0.162. Is it minus? Right. Shoot. Why did I put a plus up there? It is minus, thank you. It's a little negative, I didn't see it. So 0.01x minus 0.162. Cool. I missed that. How did you know it was minus? It was, I, I missed it too, because it's such a small little negative sign, but right here. Yeah, it's got negative right there. And that's just the, what's that? Uh, algebraically speaking, what is that? Do you think it's just No, I mean, as far as graphically speaking, it is the MX plus B. B is the Y intercept. I love it. Cool. So it just means it has a Y intercept that's negative. That's all. Cool. So if I would have put, here's a really good clue. If you would have put plus, it would have been a very obvious mistake. Why is that obviously a mistake? It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. That's supposed to be a visual averaging of all the points. It's supposed to go right down the middle of all the points. That does not. This is a little too high. So that's why it's got to be the minus. Cool. Now, in this question, they ask me, find the best predicted cost of a slice of pizza when the consumer price index is 182.5. And you got to be real careful. The CPI, the consumer price index in this case, is X. Right? So what could I do? I could either do what here? What could I do to figure that out? Find the best predicted cost of a slice of pizza. That's what Y is. Y is the... And actually, if you notice, Y actually has a little hat on it. Because it's your predicted Y. So this is the slice of pizza. And this is your consumer price index. Anybody ever heard of the consumer price index? Yeah. I like it. And that's just kind of a general feel for how much things cost. So it should make sense that they should be correlated. If the consumer price index goes up, pizza is something that we buy. It should probably go up too. But it's not lockstep, of course, because there's other things that's inside here that maybe pizza stays the same. Yeah? Um, I'm not getting, like, a graph of the points. Yeah. Zoom 9, did you zoom 9? Yeah, and I did zoom 9, and I didn't see it. You want? Everybody else okay? Everybody else is able to get this here? Really good time to tell me if you can't. Okay. Yes? Sometimes it's because it turns off. 
So the moral of the story is if, if, um, if you're borrowing a calculator on the day of the test, do not sit there and freak out if something's going wrong. Do not say, I can't ask him because it's probably me. No, it's probably the way your calculator is set up. Just come up and say, this is what I get when I try to graph it. And I'll check a few things out real quick. And if it's a mistake you made, I'll say, well, actually, it's a mistake you made. Be careful. Right? But I'll fix it if it's something that's set up wrong in the calculator. Don't, don't freak out about that. Yeah? Um, so on the test, what work do we have to show for a problem like this? Uh, pretty much... Here, I'll give you guys the answer key so you can see what I expect from you. And actually, on here, I, actually, I, I drew a little picture of it. You're obviously not going to have to do that because you're going to show me your graphing calculator. I changed some numbers in number one. This is an answer key I found from either last semester or something. And for some reason, there was one number that was different. I was like, damn. Almost. Make sure you have a front and a back. So going back to this real quick, it said, can you predict the cost of a slice of pizza when the CPI is 185.2 or 182.5? How do you do it on the calculator, somebody remember? You guys? Do it again, sir? No? I mean, that's where my equation is. But I can go up to second trace to get into calc. Value, and I just put in there 182.5. Bam, and it tells me pizza would cost, a slice of pizza would cost $1.66. Can you do that again? Certainly. And again, if you don't want to do that, all you have to do is do 0.01 times 182.5, you know, out here. 0.01 times 182.5. Don't worry, I'll do the other way too. Uh, minus 0.162. Right, so I'm just putting 182.5 into the equation. I got the same thing I got just a second ago, right? Because that's how the calculator does. When I go to second trace to get up to calc, so I'm going to calculate something on my line. Value, I want the value of something. Put in there 182.5. And the calculator, all it does is exactly that. It just plugs it in. And there's your 1.663 again. Right, the output, yeah. I'm sorry? I want you to, now what is it about this problem specifically? The two variables in this problem are CPI and cost of slice of pizza. It could be number of cricket chirps versus temperature. It could be, this is nothing general. This is just for this problem. I'm saying two one. Like, okay, how did you get that, basically? Why did you get No, no, all I did was um, do the Lin reg, right? Okay. And then just look at what I got. So there are formulas behind these, and I've done in days past when I actually had time at the end of class, I would actually show the formulas. But the formulas themselves are not very conceptually enlightening. I know it's probably the last thing some of you guys worry about, but that's one reason why this is one place I just go ahead and go straight for the calculator. Yeah? Uh, for the test, are you going to hand out the sheet of whether or not R is? Yes, good. Okay. So on the problem, I'll say what, what the cutoff R is. Okay. Right. Earlier, we knew it was 0 0.707. How are you guys going to know that? I'm going to tell you. Okay. Cool. Yeah? Uh, okay, so assuming that you know if we can trust the line that we get. Yeah, why did we trust this line? The R was big enough. 
And again, like Travis just asked, on a, on a test, I'll tell you, ours got to be 0.901 or whatever here. We got past that. We got 0.985. I, therefore, I showed evidence for correlation, which means that line of best fit is a good predictor. If it's not above 0.901, if, it, if I've already gotten 0.82, that seems strong, but my sample's so small, I can't use the line of best fit to do what we just did. I couldn't plug something in here and trust what I got. I couldn't trust it. Cool. It kind of makes sense, because visually my points would be flying all over the damn place. Why would any specific point suddenly act correct and sit on the line? I can't trust that if they're all over the place. And that's what R measures. How all over the place are they? The closer to zero, the more spread out they are, or the less linearly lined up they are in any case. But the closer to one and negative one, the more lined up they are, the more that I'm going to trust my line to find stuff. So this is a really nice uh, merger of uh, uh, technology doing some of the work for us, but we still have to think visually, does this make sense? I mean, the visuals is kind of cool here. I, I like thinking of R like a two-dimensional standard deviation, kind of measures how spread out my data is. Any other questions from? Remember, this test covers chapter 7, 8, and 10. If you did chapter 9, if you didn't realize this before, chapter 9 is extra credit. If you missed that day, uh, chapter 9 is extra credit. I will have a bonus problem. And actually, on the answer key, if you guys are looking, um, the very top on the back page is extra credit. So if you do chapter 9 and you want to do an extra credit problem, this is kind of an example of the way that I want to see a problem set up. Now, going back to the earlier question, how much work do you want to see? Look at my um, correlation problem. I'm going to ask you basically these questions. Fill in the line of best fit in the R. Tell me what R means. So I got an R here of 0 0.808. Um, I can't remember now off the top of my head. It was 20, and I think R just had to be like 0.4 something, 0.444. So 0.808 is decently strong positive correlation. If I would have gotten like, uh, if R had to be 0.444, and I got R equal to 0.452, I would say that's kind of weak positive correlation. You with me? Because it's right next to the cutoff. But if I got R equal to 0.917, then I would say that's decently strong positive correlation. You kind of with me? So I'm going to make it very black and white on this. I'm not going to, if I got an R of 0.79, is that strong or weak or medium? No, I'm, just, I'm going to have it either be really strong or really weak, right? Because I don't want to get into all the gradations of different adjectives you can use for your R. That's crazy. So I want you to say that. And also, what does it tell us about the line of best fit? Well, if it's good enough, I trust the line of best fit. I trust the line of best fit to make predictions. That's what you'd say there. And then I'm going to have a part C where I'm going to ask you to predict something. Throw it into the line. Make a prediction. So just plug a value in for X. Get a value out for Y. That's one little thing that algebra prepared you for in real life, is this. Is, is 20% no, so on this problem, the reason I worded it the way I did on um, your test, the answer key is a little different because it's before I changed the wording. I didn't want you to change the percentages just to keep the numbers because otherwise you get a funky linear a funky line of best fit, like 0.0007 or something crazy, okay. or 8 billion, I can't remember. Um, so it's just 20. Okay. So on your test, it actually says 20 out of 100, so it's just the number 20. Because those are numbers out of 100. Yeah. Cool. Now personally, i I got to tell you, like back on the East Coast, I was the, when I worked at... Um, I worked at a little liberal arts college. I actually went there for my undergrad. And I was part of what I did was I was the placement director for mathematics. So I placed every single freshman into their first math course was my job, part of my job. So I, what I did was I took all the incoming freshmen and I put into a spreadsheet. I put their SAT scores, the highest math class they took, 
their GPA in mathematics, and I made this composite score out of it. You guys with me so far? Like if you made really high on everything, your score was high. Low on some things, your score was averaged out. And then I, for our first couple semesters, I gave the placement test, and then I did a, a correlation analysis. I saw, based on what they came in with, what does it say about the score they're gonna make on the placement test? And it was, it was awesome correlation. I got like a .74, I, I still remember that number from the first time I did it. I, and I had, what was it, 600 freshmen come in. The sample size is 600, you with me? So 0.74 was six, that's, that's awesome correlation. So what could I do with this? I want you to still be with me here. So I took all the incoming scores, and then I gave them the test, did a correlation analysis, got a really good line of best fit. I trusted a lot because I got a really strong R. You guys with me? So then next semester, freshmen come in, I put the scores in, but then I used the line of best fit to predict what they're gonna make on their placement score. I didn't do anything with that individually, but I could call up the math department and say, hey guys, you're gonna need about five more 105 sections and three less of these, because it looks like we got a lot of people gonna place here. I could then tell them you know, how many sections they should have. Couldn't possibly do it here, I wish we could. But there's just so damn many students coming in all the time with all kinds of weird transcripts and parts of transcripts. It's, it's almost impossible to get a complete picture on everybody. But you guys kind of see, that's a, that's a very, you know, quick use of correlation that's very useful. I, di I didn't say anything about a specific student. Whatever I predicted you were gonna make, I didn't do it. anything with that against you. You can make higher or lower and I place you just the same, but it helped me get a general idea for everybody. How many of which sections do we need? Huh? That's huge. Sample? No, having your, knowing your, what you need basically. Yes, it's crazy. Huge. Because normally you just kind of guess. And you go, last semester we needed this. And this semester you get all these kids coming in with awesome grades and you don't have enough of your higher level math courses. And you're like, shit. So that when I started doing this, we got it really well aligned. It really came out nice. So I was really happy. And you guys are like, oh, whatever, Jeff. <laughs> that was good for you. But I mean, it's a really, I mean, it's not the best. You're, not, you're never going to have to do that yourself, probably. Most of you will never do something like that exactly. But the idea of correlation is awesome, especially the more data you've got. And the thing coming out nowadays is this, the idea of big data. The idea of what well, we talked about, Google predicting how many people have the flu and stuff like that. So if you're at all interested, you should look. There's a few good books out there about big data. Where we nowadays, we have so much space. Do you have any idea, like in 1960s, how big a computer had to be just to hold as much information as you hold currently on your phone? I mean, it's insane. And now we have flash drives that, I mean, I remember being amazed when it came out to be one gigabyte. And now they're, you have a little flash card, 64 gig. I don't know if they have 128 out yet for 120. They have a terabyte. Yeah, yeah. A terabyte little flash card? It's Holy not shit. That's insane. So nowadays, we don't have the same constrictions we used to. If you want all the data, take it. You can have all the freaking data because you have a little stupid thing that'll hold that and everything. Everybody's favorite color in the world <laughs> on the little stupid thing. It's not very useful, but I mean, that's the idea. Now, so a lot of, I won't have to worry so much about the sample stuff that we do. If I have all the data, I can then start doing much better like, I had all the data for everybody who was coming in, all the data. So I could do this across-the-board predictions, general predictions about what's going to happen. And that's exactly what's going on now. Have you guys ever used, um, the one good thing Bing is good for, you guys know Bing? I'm a Google man through and through, I'm sorry. But Bing has got that travel predictor. Have you guys ever seen that? So you go to Bing and you go to the travel section. You put in where you want to go, and it will tell you whether you should wait and buy the ticket because it'll tell you even there's an 80% chance the ticket price will go down in the next week. Or it'll tell you, go ahead and buy it now, or it says, buy it now. It's going to go up in the next week. Because they use crazy amounts of data from the last several years on what airplane, prices, air, uh, airplane ticket prices do in certain periods of time. It kicks ass. So if you've got to get a plane somewhere, go to Bing. Use their travel search. That's really awesome. And then go back to Google for every other damn thing. Yeah, <laughs> basically. All right. The test is still next Monday. The test is this Wednesday. This Wednesday? Yeah. 
You're welcome. You usually are doing that because you use the trust for the side of the line. trust the line. And we do use the R to tell if we're going to trust the line. But you're right. Um, if I had all the data, then R doesn't even shift. Here's my calculator. It's, R is all about if you have a sample, how much you trust the population, how much you trust it to model the population. If I have the whole population, I don't care what R is. That's because you're plugged in. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. There are formulas that relate the R with the slope. Okay. They're not pretty. They don't make intuitive sense. But you, you would think that there would be a relationship between R and the slope, possibly, right? And there is. Yeah. yeah. But it's not nice to look at. Uh, for us, all we do for R is, is... And R squared actually has a lot more to do with it, too, than I got into, for sure. R squared, that's why it even shows... It tells us a lot more than I had time to get into. So. Okay. Sure. Where are we at? Oh, so 